Dzień Festiwalu Malta. Dzisiaj zaczynamy, dzisiejszego dnia mamy dwa spotkania. Zaczynamy spotkanie z kuratorami tegorocznego idiomu Skok w Wiarę. Naszymi gośćmi, gośćmi Michała Nogasia, który poprowadzi spotkanie, są Jan Lawes, Grace Ellen Bark i Martin Segers, których serdecznie witamy. Ja mam takie pytanie. Czy potrzebują Państwo tłumaczenia? Na język polski. Na język polski oczywiście. 
Czy może spotkanie odbywać się w języku angielskim? Czy jeżeli ktoś potrzebuje tłumaczenia, mógł, czy mógłby podnieść rękę? Może tak będzie najprościej. Mamy cztery osoby, a możemy się umówić, że te cztery osoby byśmy usadzili przy jednym stoliku. Proszę Państwa, to może zrobimy jeszcze inaczej, bo się okazało, że właśnie przybył do nas sprzęt. Jeżeli poczekamy 5 minut, to osoby, które potrzebują tłumaczenia, dostaną słuchawki i będziemy tłumaczyć symultanicznie. Także myślę, że to jest najlepsze rozwiązanie. Po prostu poproszę jeszcze o cierpliwość. 5 minut i zaczniemy spotkanie. Dziękuję. The score is 4 to 1 for Belgium. Loser! This is unfair, honestly. So unfair. We have, we have one Tunisian actor in our group, so he's the loser of Need Company now. But he has the Belgian. But he's the best dancer. You can better dance than football. Huh? And also he got his Belgian nationality last week. Exactly. To be honest, he's the only one who will be the winner in case of the winning of any of the teams. So he's the double winner, honestly.
Państwa, jeszcze raz powtórzymy komunikat specjalny. Nie, nie dotyczy on wyniku meczu Belgia prowadzi 4-1, tylko spraw technicznych związanych z tłumaczeniem. Dotarł do nas sprzęt, który będziemy mogli przekazać wszystkim osobom, które potrzebują tłumaczenia na język polski. Tłumaczenie będzie symultaniczne. Do tej pory zgłosiły się cztery osoby. Czy jest zapotrzebowanie większej liczby osób, czy zostajemy przy tych czterech? Osoby, które potrzebują słuchawek mogą zgłosić się tam do stolika przy białym namiocie i je odebrać od Pani Anny, która jest naszym tłumaczem. Przypominam, że to nie są słuchawki na silent disco, więc e, będzie tylko słowo. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think everyone's got his or her iPhones, and then we can start the translation, if it's going to work. I'm looking at Anna. Are we ready to start? Can we start? Yeah? Okay. So, if anyone more needs uh, iPhones, please go to the, uh, to the back of this uh, tent and find it. Uh, once again, I would like to welcome the three curators of this year's Malta Festival, which are, and I would like to ask for applause, Grace Allen Barkey, <laughs> Jan Lovis, <laughs> and last but not least, Martin Segers. <laughs> and I would like to uh, ask you to welcome also Mr. Sven Gartz, which is the Ministry of Culture of the Thunder. Welcome. Very nice to be, have you here with us. Uh, you a huge representative of Flemish people working for the culture. I saw Stefan Herkmans and his wife somewhere there, so uh, welcome once again. Uh, okay, I think that uh, we should start with the score. It's still 4 to 1 for uh, Belgium, and it shows that this meeting will be exciting, enough, exciting probably, for all the football fans. Uh, I would like to start with a question which seems to be obvious uh, about your understanding, your meaning of the title of this year Malta's idiom, which is of course Leap of Faith. How do you want to break the yeah, want to break the ice? Yeah, you Jan. Okay. Let's go. First of all I want to, to, to say a very quick thank to Mihal and his and his the whole team of uh, of Malta Festival. It is a wonderful week here. The Vice Ministry of Culture of Poland, Mr. Michał Olczyński, please welcome. It's really, it's really unbelievable. It's the first time that Need Company can do something big like this. 
Uh, also thanks to, to the Minister of Culture, my boss, Sven Gatz, who is here. Uh, so it is every night, there was something else every night, there was something special for us. And I, we felt also through, during the week the leap of faith growing, uh, which is a very good sign. Um, and to be here with a leap of faith, leap of faith means a jump into the unknown. And I think that's a very beautiful definition of what art should be. Art should ask questions, art should make you sometimes uncomfortable, make you think differently. So the unknown in, in the word faith was for us the reason to choose this uh, definition. Grace? And yes, th that is absolutely true. And But also for me, leap of faith is a movement. It is the leap itself that you have to be willing to take a risk to jump into something and uh, the jumping itself is um, is something that you you need to have an attention to uh, to make the movements to make to make yourself go into something that you don't know and uh, it's not only it's not only a definition of art but it is for a lot of things or important decisions or uh, all, all things in life. Uh, I would say we, we s sometimes think we know something, but actually of course we don't. Uh, we all know that we don't know so many things, which could sound uh, discouraging, but I would say let it be uh, encouraging. Uh, and go for it. It's a bit naive to think that we could really be the same being together, but we can at least try to somehow be together. So uh, let's stress uh, the courage to try that. Let's go. Probably having a collective of curators, it's very similar to the way you work as a new company, as a collective of great people making theater together, but being a curator in a group or by yourself, it's a kind of a challenge you have to, uh, you have to fight with. Uh, so I would like to ask about the way you constructed your, your part of Marta Festival program. How, what was the way you were thinking about this idiom part of this year's Malta? It was, of course, a very bumpy ride. Eh? Uh, everybody knows a bit the political situation, the problems with the uh, financial problems. So when, when uh, the Malta Festival asked us to curate, uh, the assignment was to invite uh, 10 internationally interesting artists. But then that was not possible anymore. So uh, we, we changed our opinion. The your Minister of Culture says no, so we couldn't come and then we talked very intensively about it. What can we do? Uh, can we be present in Malta Festival or shall it die? So we didn't want to die and we feel we felt the enormous energy of, of uh, the team of Malta and the conviction to go on with this. So that's why we are here for I think to to make the choice uh, became very, uh, also very interesting for us to say, okay, we are going to do six nights in a row uh, in another country where there are conflicts like in our country, in Europe, in every country in Europe is now a, a big conflict happening. Art is somewhere in danger, I think. So to come here every night to have another kind of a presentation, another kind of discussion with several artists. That was, in fact, when I started a neat company together with Grace 30 years ago, that was a bit the aim. And now uh, I'm a very happy man that I could see in Poznan what we did for 30 years. That's my personal feeling. I think we should all try. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> What's even born? No, even born. How old are you, Martin? I'm 17. 17. Seven. It is very difficult to work with Martin. 
because of you know this Child gap, this, this <laughs> giant gap between us. Like you have a kindergarten in the theater. Anyway, we, we, okay, I see. we managed, we managed, we, we survived. We only have this one more night to do, and uh, yeah, then we and then we are free for two days from each other. Yes. The, the weird thing is for me, personally, that of course I've been performing every night. So it's all about Martin this week. No, but the weird thing is that of course we are also here as curators, uh, and we try to take that part of the job as serious as possible, but of course we've also been invited as, uh, as artists. Uh, and I missed a lot of everything else that was going on, and I feel very sorry about that. I'm very curious about it. Uh, I'm sure I will hear of it. Uh, I hope you were all there on all the other things that happened. Yeah, we heard from the public several uh, interesting things of uh, Polish uh, work was, was going on, and yeah, we were very sorry that we could not see. Messiahs. Yeah, Messiahs, but also other things I heard of. Because you have to know that, that to come to Poland, uh, coming from uh, Flanders, from Belgium, uh, when I started theater in the 80s, the great examples of theater came from Poland. You're, you're, uh, you were very, very strongly present in, in, in Europe in the, in the 70s. Eh? Uh, and the inspiration of, of uh, from Grotowski, Tadeusz Kanto, and then uh, now Lupa Walikowski. It, it was, it's an honor to, be, to make theater here. And still now when you see, uh, like for example, the reading of the book of Stefan Hetmans uh, yesterday, I think here on the Liberty Square, uh, the actress, I saw her also, I've got an name now, sorry. I saw her also playing with Walikowski. You have such a good performance and such a good, high quality of actors that uh, when people appreciate what you do, you know also the quality of the public here. So that's why it is a great inspiration also for us to be here. So, uh what you said yeah, a few minutes ago, I think we need to discuss a little bit longer or maybe you will just tell us your opinions and the audience would like to take a, a part of this conversation. You would like to participate. We invite you, right, to, to talk to us since the beginning, not to wait until the last part of, the, uh, of, of this meeting. You said that we see the conflict in Europe now and the art is in danger not only in Poland, but also in Belgium, all around Europe. Uh, what you mentioned before, even during your lecture last week, last weekend. So, why do you think so? What, and what are the biggest threats for the art and culture in nowadays Europe? The biggest threat for art is that, that, that art is, um, like the, your mayor said uh, a few hours ago against, uh, to me, that art can save democracy. I think that is what art is. Art is uh, like what Ray says in her work, unbind your mind. I, I think when you choose for a nation and not for people, when you don't choose for solidarity or whatever, when you build walls, then you destroy art as well. Art has to communicate us. Art is, is, is binding people together. So that's why in, uh, there are a lot of nations or a lot of countries in, in Europe who try to push Europe in a nation situation and nation states yeah, yeah. and that's why and, and the first thing they do is stop with the arts and that is why I think uh, we have to be careful that we defend art there is also uh, puritanism coming in there's much more censorship um, there are more and more paintings forbidden uh, paintings who were like 100 years in a museum, like, like, like Courbet's L'Origine du Monde, uh, is now taken out of the museum because it's too provocative, and it was hanging there for 100 years. This is what is happening today. And, and so the reactionary forces getting more and more vulgar, and more and more, they get more and more power, and that's why I think there is a danger going on, and luckily we have uh, good artists and we have good people and we have good public 
to defend them. Why is that? Why, why is the reason that this vulgarity and puritanism is growing up in Europe again? How do you think? Wow, should we really go into that? <laughs> then I have to uh, ask my minister. He is much more in politics than me. But it is... Um, yeah. I think that uh, people are are more um, directed into seeing something in a certain way, and um, it is, I think, fear. And I think that's why art is so important. That everybody should have the freedom to look at things in their own way. I think that it's a very difficult question what you ask. I think you can only just, uh, well, recognize that uh, fact of evolution. Uh, and when you talk about uh, art being endangered, I think, I think that's also a very complex sort of remark because actually, of course, art means something else for many different people. So, uh, once you connect words as uh, good art or bad art or uh, something that's significant or insignificant or, uh, yeah, optimistic or pessimistic uh, towards the future and so on, it of, of course totally depends on the people who look at it and use it or don't use it and consume it or don't consume it. So much more even than art in itself and the production of it, it's about how it's been regarded and how it would be, uh, what's the word in English? Uh, well, just used, let's say, uh, or uh, recupéré. Um. I think, I think, I, I think when Grace says fear, it is about confirmation. Uh, art has to become a tool for confirmation. Um, and that is not the, the meaning of art. Art should not confirm. Uh, when art's confirmation, then it becomes uh, entertainment. But the problematic, more the, pro more. the problematic part is, of course, that when you want to share the art that you make, the people who come to accept it are also wanting to accept it. So it's it's a difficult sort of cycle of confirmation to uh, to break. Because as long as you stay within the format of making and presenting art as we do it, it's, in a way, it's kind of a safe uh, cycle, of course. But, but art is not only a format. Art is not only a thing that you have to take a distance to. Uh, I, I, I think it is, it is a lot to do with imagination, and that's why it is not something special or something that some people see or other people don't see. I think it has everybody experience art because everybody experiences that you can dream or that you can imagine something or that you can see colors or so. I would like to ask, because I had a chance to see only a few of your works here at Manta Festival, as you said, the, the program is uh, really huge and you have to choose what do you want to see and what time you can see, uh, or what, what do you have to be. But I would like to ask you about the, the method of your work. I mean, the way you're, you're choosing the subjects you're working on, like what would you like to show to the audience? What kind of themes or subjects seems to be important to you? Company, Need Company. Yeah. Well, well, Need Company is is um, a group of people. Need Company is founded by Grace and me, but uh, we are trying. Martin, Grace, and myself. We are creators. We are artists. We are working in a house in uh, a, sm a small part of Brussels, Molenbeek, that was heavenly in the news. Uh, in a heavy way um, with uh, terrorism and jihadism and all that. We are living there and it's fantastic to work there. It's a very big source of inspiration. We have an, an open house there. There are more people working there. Uh, also now in the Malta Festival we present 
a few films of people, uh, newcomers in Belgium. We try to, to open the house. We try to um, not only make the productions uh, as theater uh, performers, but we do visual art, we, do, we make films. And the, there's always one person who takes responsibility for one uh, item, for one production. So when Grace makes a creation and Martin is performing and it's like forever, then Martin wants, wants that Grace takes the end responsibility. That's an agreement. There's no discussion. But during the, the work in progress, we try to be inspired by each other. So it's, it's a kind of a collective way of thinking with somebody who is in charge. That, is, uh, that makes it quite unique because we also have always a very vivid discussion about what we are making. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. Um, and that's what I felt again here in, in Malta when I saw the work of Grace and the opening night of Martin. Uh, and now we are doing more in Turkey time. You see the different qualities of, of us and the, 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 there is a link between us. There is some kind of, there's a, a human approach somehow. It's always about uh, the authenticity of somebody on stage, I think. That's our uh, aim. There is a um, neat company is also always uh, linked with international art. That means we were from the beginning speaking in four languages, having seven, eight, nine different nationalities. These were things that we have chosen for. It was almost a political statement to say, let's make with the language international theater. It didn't exist in the 70s. We started in 79, 80 for the first time. It started to, to, uh, to grow, this international theater. And it doesn't make it easier. So that's also one thing that we do. Let's not make it easy. Why should we go the easy way if there's a difficult way? That's what we do a little bit. Yeah. And for how long do you stay in Molenbeek? We moved um, one and a half year ago. Yeah. And before that we, we were um, based in the city centre. I'm asking because yesterday during the our conversation with Stefan and previously we were hearing uh, Mabuzata Girl uh, reading uh, his great play. What happened in the game? Five one. Yeah. Why am I saying this again? Oh no, sorry. <laughs> are you watching football while we are talking? No, I'm ch I'm, ch I'm checking the score for you, <laughs> but but it's four one. Still four one. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Minister, don't make <laughs> Do not always believe what politician says. <laughs> uh, but coming, back, coming back to Mullenbeck, uh, which is a very important place in nowadays Brussels, as Stefan said, and he wrote this, uh, this play. Uh, did this move you make, like coming to, the, to a new place, change your theater, change you as humans, change your view and perspective on what you're doing and how, you, how do you work with, with the other actors? I think it, it was for us a possibility to open up more um, our, our group, to, to have more uh, possibilities to invite young people and to um, be aware of the city. We, we, had, we, have, we have now more space to uh, invite people for tea, you know, uh, cook something for, for, for people that come and visit us. And um, so we are, we have, that is what changed, that we are more aware of, uh, or that we can be, uh, have the possibility to, to be more aware that we are living in, uh, in Brussels and that uh, what it means and to have contact not only with with neighborhood but also with young artists and giving them opportunities to use our space and it makes you it, it, it keeps you sharp there is is we we're living also in a very beautiful time for artists i think it's very good that there's confusion that there are reactionary forces that there's a young generation coming up who's very strong uh, 
and that, for example, a lot of uh, newcomers coming to Europe, and also there, there are, there's a new generation of very fine artists, and, and we try to, 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 to keep a connection with them, to work with them, uh, and so there is also this tendency of the hashtag me too of the, the the male art against female art there is there is a big polemic polemic discussion going on which is inspiring for me which for me personally i i need to to be my ass kicked to rethink everything and so i think for everybody it's a different opinion about Molenbeek, but for me it's it's keeping me sharp and um, I have the feeling that um, in this and a few years, art will change a lot because the world is changing a lot. Art will follow and be totally different in a few years. And my hope, my hope is that theatre will survive because I think, that what I said before, the, the authenticity of theatre is a, a personal stage is more authentic than somebody in real life nowadays. To go inside a room to see somebody doing something uh, is almost a futuristic uh, idea now. And that makes it very beautiful. Grace agreed with you, so I would like to ask you, can we predict what kind of change is going to happen? Um, I don't know, no, no. I think it is very difficult uh, for, for me this, this, this the attention to things, yeah, I think that is, that is, uh, hopefully it is coming back. I, I feel that there are things are, are coming back, like, you know, all this attention on, on, on um, multimedia, all these phones, everybody w walking with his phones, that changed the way of how you look at things. And um, I, s I feel that uh, younger generations are already, taking a distance of that and start to look again um, uh, to quality of things. So I cannot pre predict it, but I feel a very strong uh, connection to uh, young artists and also to uh, newcomers. Uh, I have very interesting conversations uh, with this uh, generation of um, with all different colors and yeah but you have also you yourself eh? you were also a refugee eh? you came from in surabaya but at that time it was not so significant as now for you well, it was but we forgot about yeah, it exactly yeah so the 20 uh, when i was two years old i i i also left uh, my parents left indonesia and we came uh, to europe without anything and they left everything behind, but yeah, you forget about it because um, you're happy and you are able to follow school, to learn things, to meet uh, people. And I think that is so important. That is what we have to give each other, uh, the freedom to, to, uh, to educate, to, to study, to, to think and to imagine things. Um, and I have the feeling that this, um, with this new crisis of, of newcomers, of people that are coming to Europe, um, we should think back to the history and we have these waves of, of, uh, of people are leaving their country. And we are in the middle of this wave now and that these are always the most interesting times and it is nice that we cannot predict what what the next art is yeah, I going think, to I be. think we can if something will change is I'm quite convinced that the idea of, of exotism will disappear we looked before to African art or to Chinese art as an exotic new element, we were watching Japanese dance in the 80s, 90s, we didn't understand anything of Buddha or no theater, but we appreciate the exotic idea behind it. We were attracted in an exotic way. And this is over now. 
when I talk with, with, with the newcomers, when I see, the, uh, the, yesterday we showed uh, the film of the young Syrian refugee Rand. Uh, maybe she's here? No, she's not here. Um, and that is no longer an exotic approach. That's a down-to-earth, hardcore art approach. And art is then no longer exotic. The, 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 let's say that the Western supremacy of what is beautiful or not, or what is art and not, this will disappear. There will be something else. We, me as male, white, older person, should rethink my definition of beauty, should rethink my definition of art, and I really force myself to destroy this exotic approach towards other cultures. This is what we have to learn. This is very interesting, uh, what you just said, and still coming back to yesterday's conversation with Stefan Feldmans, who's with us. Uh, Stefan said yesterday that, for example, there are uh, very interesting poets and writers from the Maghreb countries who are changing a, a little bit the literature in Belgium or in the Netherlands. They are using old and new language, which is retransforming the literature. Do you think that the meeting with people coming to 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 Europe, to West West Europe, and to to your collective need company can somehow change the way theatre will work, or do you think they will bring something new that will change the way you're working and change the way you're showing things on stage? For sure, uh, I think a very nice, important evolution. A fast evolution is that it, it's changing from, uh, let's say, us as Western artists uh, talking about those people in some sort of a documentary way, which has been happening a lot in the last years, and that now more and more this can also make space again for their actual art once that people have arrived here and they are being embraced in our system that they can actually produce what they want to produce uh, and sometimes it would still be of course about the topic of them being refugees and so on but it could even be other topics that they would be treating when they would still be in their co country of origin and so on so that very fast uh, there becomes uh, there's a stage that's available for their own content and not only for our regards on them. And also that there is another background. Let's not forget that we have the, the 20th century, we have modernism, postmodernism. A big part of the world never heard about postmodernism or modernism. They, it doesn't exist. So I think that is also something that we have to put in our minds and that, that people are jumping over the 20th century. In China, they did it. First reaction of the Chinese artists in the 90s was, let's copy, like Ai Weiwei, he copied Western artists. Now they say, no, stop, we don't copy anymore. Let's go back to our own history, which is very rich, 5,000 years of art in China, comes back. And then we can find the balance. And off goes this exotism. That's what okay, I, okay. I think is happening now. And I think we should question ourselves. The 20th century was maybe too fast. When I, I thought it was a relief to read yesterday in the newspaper that the a piece of art, the Urinoir of Duchamp, as the most significant art object of the 20th century, is probably a lie. It's not from him, it's from a, a woman. So the, the most paradigmatic piece of art of the 20th century is maybe bullshit. This is something very interesting to think about. And then we can talk to somebody else. That's what I think. I would like to ask you one more question, but uh, if there are people in the audience, uh, here you can clap your hands, that's great. If there is anyone in the audience who would like to ask our curators something about, just let us know now. Is there anyone? No one? You were preparing for that, so, okay. I would like to ask you about the world in Turpentine we saw yesterday in the theatre, which is a fantastic play, so congratulations. And I would like to ask the, the way uh, you presented the war, because uh, I, I have even had a conversation with Stefan Hetmans about it today in the morning, that what you saw as this war part of the, of the play and of the book 
is um, no guns, no gun machines, no tanks, just one-on-one -on -one simple human play and fight. And so many, and so much animal instinct shown on stage. The way the people are fighting with each other, it's like in tribal, tribal some somehow many years ago. So why why did you decided to show this period of our history the way like this? Well, it's written. Eh? <laughs> Stefan wrote this uh, in the second part of the book. It's about the war, and when I was reading it. I was reading quicker, like, yeah, yeah, Stefan is disgusting. Uh, it is now, oh, I don't want to read that, you know? And so war is not, it's not possible to show war. All the war films from Sp Steven Spielberg and all these people, they did a great job in entertainment. And we like to see war films, and it's fantastic to see how blood goes. But this is fake. War is boredom, is fear, is, is, is things. And so you cannot do that. So when we were working on the second part, I was totally confused. Yesterday I saw it again and I said, it is too much entertainment. We still, it's still beautiful. But how can you make something boring that is interesting? How can you show that it is not comfortable? to be in a war zone and that was that is always my frustration when we come to that scene so i said to vivian shut up just show this text like it's boring it's boring it's boring for half an hour and then you feel what war can be five one thank you um and uh, probably you're going to win the game <laughs> <laughs> but uh so it is yesterday i, I thought again let's change this whole third part again uh, because it is impossible and what we put on stage in this half an hour is the bodies is the sensuality of the bodies and to try to not be together and be together something like that and and, and uh, it was the most difficult thing to uh, to direct and to do also because how can I ask Mohammed or Grace or Martin to say, just beat the shit out of each other, just beat each other, and they are always painful in the in the in the in the, in the rehearsals, and and then you have to go to the hospital, or this dagger was in somebody's eye, and then and I'm sitting there as a director, yeah, go on, a bit harder, yeah, a bit harder. It was almost perverse, and so that is the difficult part of of the job that we do. Eh? You uh, you take risks as a performer. But maybe you should talk you that yeah, to do you it. See, you, start, you start this five on stage and, it, and you follow. I mean, the, the first step and then you go into another. It's like in the psychiatric experiment that when you start to beat, even if it's your friend, then you're in that fight and you want to push it harder and harder. And that's what I saw observing you on stage yesterday, which was amazing somehow. But how it looks like from the actor's part and actor's side. It's just really funny to do. <laughs> is it true, Michael? Is it funny to do? I hate it. <laughs> no, it's it's great fun. But uh, of course, it's not uh, it's not real. I mean, uh, yeah, we hurt each other, but uh, we love each other. That's a big difference, of course. That's why we can do it because we we love each other. We can hurt each other. Otherwise, it would not be possible. But I think, of course, that's also part of... Uh, Except Mohamed, of course. <laughs> that's also part of uh, Jan's choice and approach on that moment, is to see whether stuff should be choreographed or should have a sense of realness. And I'm very interested personally, I was very happy that this approach was the approach of this project. Because I'm very fascinated in where uh, performers could also be questioned until where you hardly see the difference between uh, something that could be real. Uh, so this real aggression was was like a... We, we never had this sort of experience before as performers. Uh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You, your, your shows are always about that. It's always about the limit, but can you do with your body? Also, more Yes, body. but that's more towards myself. Yeah. Not so much towards somebody else that I like. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, but the, it's, it's still a difference, but I, I, of course I see what you mean. Eh? Uh, there's some sort of a... Uh, of course you want to show, and I think maybe that's something we also share uh, in our works, that you want to show the actual people. So you need to go through this process of uh, performing and not so much acting. Um, you know the difference between performance and acting? That's clear. So the acting is in fact based on reproduction and performance is based on production. So you do something only once, then you perform. If you have produced it, you become an actor. That's a little bit, that's an easy definition to work with. When Marx says you become more a performer than an actor, just to clear that. Yeah, it, somehow it's like we, uh, I, I can punch uh, Grace uh, differently tonight and we don't know yet uh, what the outcome will be and that's... What can I do? Yeah, it's, so in, it, somehow there's like a realness uh, of the experience and the unexpected outcome of the situation. Um, I think one of the most amazing things I saw a couple of years ago was a Japanese uh, performance collective uh, called uh, Contact Gonzo and they were having this performance where they uh, where it's all about uh, the agreement that they can actually beat the shit out of each other without uh, being angry about it after the show uh, and it's extremely aggressive and it's very difficult to watch in a way because of course you don't want to you want you don't want this realness to be in the uh, framework of illusion that the theater is right so uh, but I think we're also beyond uh, the era where uh, it's all about illusion so it's a very interesting uh, yeah, part of the field to work in right now. And I'm happy also that within this uh, very epic theatrical uh, narration that we made with Jan, that there is, you know, this questioning of performance uh, up until that level uh, in the creation. Anyhow, when you were lying under this uh, small stage of the musician zone, I was afraid that they would crunch your bones when you were there, so it's uh, it's really moving even in that part of uh, observing. Yeah, that part was acting. <laughs> that was acting. Otherwise, oh, too dangerous. You, you didn't perform. Okay, that's cool. Uh, the final score is two for Tunisia, five for Belgium. So we won. Congratulations. Okay, and uh, oh, it's done. Stop saying this. It's so unfair. Uh, are there any questions for our curators? For you can take revenge tonight, Mohamed. We can invite him. I think that will pass for you. I'm with you, no worries. <laughs> Poland is playing for everything tomorrow, so no worries. Uh, any questions for the curators? Yeah? Okay, I will go with my microphone. No, Martin, it's okay. Yeah, I would like to go back to this international context, but also like going back to the local context. Because you said that you started to create your kind of theater, and it's supposed to be the international from the very beginning. But you, actually you as, as the root, you, you were from, from Belgium. And um, so, like, do you think that it would be possible to create something like this outside of, of Belgium or, or Flanders? Of course. I think. Or like how would it I be? think. I think it's um, the best way to start is to come from a very small country. Um, like we are from the north part of Belgium, it's called Flanders, and there are six million or something people speaking our language. So as a writer, you cannot sell so many books. If you're French, you have like uh, 75 million people speaking French or more. Eh? So there is also an urge for us in Flanders to read, to learn other languages, even to, to, to just to read books. They are not all translated. So uh, we have a normal situation that most of the Flemish people speak two or three languages. Yeah? And so that's already helpful. You see that in Sweden also, they speak always very good English. And it's a necessity for us to learn English and French. Just like here, you can easily speak English to a lot of people. In Spain, it's already much more difficult because Spanish is a much bigger language. 
So because of the necessity of reaching more people, you are used to speak different languages, so the step to go to work with other people within other languages was maybe not so difficult. Yeah, but I'm, so not, it, yeah. I'm not really talking just about the language-wise. It's also... No, but that was the easy part. So, so <laughs> for me, it was a political choice, of course, to... Uh, I was working with, by the way, uh, the, the founder of the whole Flemish wave in the 80s is, by coincidence, here as well. That's the, the, great, the white man with the sunglasses, Hugo de Grave. He started everything. Without, without him, we would not be here. That's Hugo de Grave. Give him a good applause. Come on! I think you mean how do you start doing that? Well, but, but, but I want to go to that. Eh? When, when, when we were working, we were 23, 24 years old, we were talking with Hugo de Grey, we were seeing what does it mean to make theatre, how his dream was to make an international festival. My dream was to meet other people. He started a guy festival and we saw Wooster Group, we saw people from China, from Japan, they come to Brussels for the first time. For the first time. And you see other cultures and say, wow, this is interesting. So you start to talk with other people. And that's how it started. And on that moment, a few years later, 85, 86, I was living in Antwerp, the Vlaams Bloc, which was a fascistic, neo-fascistic party, had 33% of the votes. They became extremely nationalistic in Antwerp. And I said, we really have to start something. And that's why I started Need Company and Expansion. It has to be international. We, got, we, we take an English title just to, to make a fist. Now I should not do that anymore, I think. But then I felt a necessity. Uh, so it was a political statement. Uh, and also a very ambitious statement that could exist because we met people like Hugo, who was also thinking, how big is the world? Yeah. So this internationality for you was to reach as many people as possible? Yeah, to meet, to meet and work with people that you don't speak the language, that, that, that I, I, we started working with Argentinian actors, with, with Spanish actors, and it was so strong that you realized it is very easy to talk with people from other countries. It was very easy to go uh, abroad and communicate with art. It, was, it is there is no problem in the communication. When when we play uh, War in Turkestan here or we play it in Tokyo, you can talk in the same way. There are of course very beautiful differences, but essentially you can talk together. And and before the 70s, it didn't. Before the 80s, it didn't exist. It didn't exist. So for us, it's now quite normal for you to, to say to you, yeah, it's easy to start. I think you should start. It is there now. International theater is not new anymore. It is there. But uh, there's international theater going abroad to play internationally. And of course, also there's the fact that within the uh, collective of people, you have people with very different backgrounds. Right? I think that's probably easier to do nowadays in Brussels than here. Because we are just, we're all there together anyway. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Because here it's here, not so much the case. Yeah, exactly. And especially in the theater. Like with this all romantic history we have. And like it's kind of a heavy history we have. Uh, so, but isn't it just, wasn't it easier because you are saying that people um, abroad, when you perform, they understand. So isn't it just also the matter of the language of the theater? And on the other hand, how, how your style became inter international? Because I have a feeling that you are saying, um, whenever you refer to the internationality of, of your works, it's not just that you speak whatever language you want to speak. It's also, OK, you work with group of people that come from very different countries, but it, like, it's 
something in between that became this internationality, I think. And like, do you also perceive it like this? Or are you just like my impression? I, I, I don't think we, we think about that. It's also a lot we about, don't think how, about you, that. how you're being received. Eh? It's also how much, very much how, how you how you are being invited and being received, and that maybe if you say like, well, we have this whole history to deal with before we can come to something else, uh, maybe we hit we have less of that problem, uh, and that's maybe that sort of work would be welcomed elsewhere. You know, it's 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 both. It's not only an ambition from, for example, this company or other companies to go somewhere else. It's also the ambition of places in the world to, to get open and receive new sort of informations. Like, and maybe in the past it has to do with some sort of a, a degree of uh, ex uh, exotism. But now, of course, we're beyond that. And I think the, we, are, we, are, we have such a global connection. There are so many festivals, there are so many groups traveling that the exchange between young people goes much quicker than before. So there is, on a certain level, it's easier, I think. And the competition is bigger. Yeah. Uh, other questions? In other in other in questions? In, in, a way, in a way, this uh, example of the movie of Arant is very interesting because she she's from Syria. She arrived not so long ago in Belgium. And now, how many years? Two years ago only she arrived in Belgium and now she's producing movies that are now being shown in festivals internationally. You know, so this network... But she's 21 years old. Not only spatially but also in time, of course, it's like... But that's because... Unseen no. sort of tempo and space. Uh, but I want to point out, if we talk about the film of Rand yesterday, it is not because she's from Syria. It is not because she's a refugee. It is because she is a brilliant thinker. She makes a good film. That's why you have to say it. And that's why I say it's no longer exotic. It's no longer exotic. The quality is, per definition, the aim of every festival to show the good things, to, to, to work on a high level. And then it doesn't matter if you're Polish or Flemish. I don't believe in that anymore. I think the quality of, of, uh, of Rand is because it's a good artist. And that maybe you can say, because what she survived in her traveling towards Europe, the horrific stories she had behind, maybe that enriches her as an artist. That's another, of course, another uh, dialogue we have to have done. Now, other questions? Yeah, there is one. I will go. Hi, uh, I would like to come back to this name, Leap of Faith. And when I'm thinking about Leap of Faith, it's like something like situation when a uh, father is in the swimming pool and child is on, on the border and he has to take a risk, jump. And father says, don't worry, trust me, you can jump. So Leap of Faith is some kind of do something unknown, but based on something, on some promise or some something you you want, you expect to do, or expect to gain, or just to survive. So my question is, uh, do you have in your art right now, in you standing in front of some kind of leap of faith for you in this uh, uh, situation? Why, you say, why didn't you say there is a father watching you jump? No, it's a, it's it's a, a is that the father is not there. Uh, no, no. Like, I have to believe my father to jump. Yeah, and when you don't have a father, and you're not that little child at the swimming pool, there's no father. Go Do you jump? jump? Down, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you jump? That's okay. Well, what, so what is faith? Faith is decision to believe somebody. Right. Faith is the unknown. It's not believe. Is it, is it, yeah, do you think like this? Faith, I, I believe I have to choose between something, and this is for me, this is faith. Yes? Or I believe in my own opinion or something, but it's always based on something. Yes? It has to be related to something. 
it might be believing, but to me, the word can easily be uh, exchanged with uh, trusting, which is for me totally based on the word trust. Okay. Yeah. The fact that the fact that the swimming pool could be the art history, that could be helpful. Uh, but even then, uh, it's not because your father is at the swimming pool that you jump. Eh? I think that is that is too easy. Um, I think you take the word faith and very direct and leap of faith, English, the whole thing leap of faith means that you you jump in so without that there is a father, you jump in the, in the unknown, you go to Mars with the, with the rocket and you see what happens. Yeah, but you expect something. Going to Mars, you expect something. You believe you will. You will expect. Otherwise, you, you don't have jump. hope. You have hope. Yeah, but that's why Grace says it's about the jump. Yeah. So, so, so the, the jump. Mo yeah. It's Sorry. about the jump. So jump is more important than expectations and what you can meet there. That's so almost Nietzsche. So. What you say now? Eh? The jump is more impo important than the the landing. That is Nietzsche. I, I agree a bit on that. Uh, yeah, okay, but I think it's it's really important to know why you are jumping and what do you want to achieve. I think it is also important to know that you don't know why you are jumping. When you always know why you are jumping, then you, you can make the decision not to jump anymore. Okay, but I, I understand what you say, the necessity of the jump. Okay, you made the metaphor of the swimming pool. Now we go to the Niagara Falls. Eh? There's a point of no return. When you go up, uh, further than the point of no return, you die. You go in the Niagara and you're dead. So imagine you're there with your child. Your child falls in the water on the point of no return. Let's change the title of the idiom. <laughs> your child falls in the water. The father will jump Although he knows he will die, if he doesn't jump, he will be dead as well. That's a leap of faith. Well, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to raise a question? Um, good afternoon. I'd like to come back to what you said um, about illusion and the transgression thereof. Like, isn't there a necessity of illusion? Because once real lads are falling on stage, then, you know, when it's you and it's the artist that does it himself, that's fine. If you, what you said about loving each other and agreeing upon it. But what it does to the viewer it like inflicts something very dangerous in the viewer and it isn't there like any order at all that you think that you know um, separates what art should be and could be uh, from what could potentially be very harmful to both the individual and the society for sure I think uh, I, I totally agree it's I don't know where that border would be or how to define it but I very much agree, and I think uh, when it becomes documentary, to me, I have a, mostly a big problem accepting it as art, for example. Although it, that has been a very sort of confusing uh, area for many years now, I find when I go to see uh, art. Uh, of course, I understand very much the socially uh, engaged aspect of documentary, but when it, when it is actually about realness i understand that it becomes very difficult to uh, uh to just accept this uh, as art for sure what we were talking about before of course is that we within within the framework of this illusion that theater is to accept uh to work around this idea of realness which isn't the same as uh as totally accepting it as uh, as the truth you know uh, on the other hand, sometimes it's very simple, like last night I went to see the show of uh, Lopke uh, and Maxim in the castle. And the first 20 minutes I was so uncomfortable because it looked like they didn't breathe out since the beginning of the show. Of course, it's, it's not a big problem. If they actually didn't breathe out, then, then it's their problem. They won't die for me there, I know that. We are still in the agreement of the illusion. 
you know. Also, we are not promoting something that would go necessarily beyond that. People have been trying to do that in the past when uh, performance coming out of the visual, visual art was very much about provoking that. Um, and since that has happened, of course, we recognize that and acknowledge this as a sort of inspiration and also as something we need to use in our questioning when we make performance art. Uh, but clearly, it's... But it's it's part of the investigation. Yes, and, and of course, uh, when you talk about the show of yesterday night with Vivian the Monk as the storyteller, for me, it has also, whether they are fighting or whether there is a, a nice, beautiful image happening, it's also about the quality of acting the material. Vivian the Monk, for example, the way she did her, uh, her, her narration yesterday, I was blown away. Even I saw it already so many times yesterday that the level of narration was so high that uh, this is also part of the game, of course. Eh? We, uh, I don't think, uh, but, but, I, but I, I really think more and more is that the authenticity of Vivian on stage and the time she takes to tell the story, this authentic, authentic moment becomes for me more and more a necessity. And that's maybe because I'm getting used also to just SMS to to make, uh, I don't write letters, we write mails, you know. So everything becomes shorter, everything becomes more compact, we don't have to talk. So all of a sudden this authenticity, we, we are talking already a whole week, the three of us, about the time we use on stage. When is something getting boring? What is boredom on stage? Why is Why do you feel that something is too long? How does that, where it, how does it function in your head when you start to get bored? And why is it, in my experience, that the best shows I saw or the best film of Tarkovsky, or there's always a moment of total boredom. I fell asleep a bit and then I wake up again and I see the most beautiful part of the film. So what is that? That is authentic time feeling, I think. I think that you also talked about how people can be disturbed and how we think about it and Martin an answers that uh, it is anyway theater is an agreement that we are going to imagine something that is not real but also sometimes it is the opposite sometimes we do performances in musea and uh, we do for example a whole night and I would yeah, people we, we could do something um, uh, uh, sit, just sitting somewhere or doing an action and people can come very very close and then it is also we that take the risk that somebody could disturb this uh, or, or, or um, yeah hurt us or you know so I think we are very much aware of um, what is illusion and what is real and I think also the audience uh, has has a very big part in that. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, I wanted to refer mostly to something that Jan said during our conference at our university a few days ago, because we know that you have both the experience of working in a theatre collective and in the institutional, institutionalised theatre. And during the course of the discussion, I was somehow made to believe that there is a huge gap between the way in which these two instances somehow work. I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the things that they can learn from each other? Because I think that there is a bridge that there is possible to build between working in a theatre collective and working in an institutionalised theatre. And I think that you as a creator have a basis of experience to somehow build the, build the bridges between yeah, these two I don't know. I, I don't know if you need bridges there. It's possible. Uh, I think what we do with Need Company is, is somehow uh, try to figure out what kind of bridge you, you build. But um, what you're talking about is, is, is um, when I, my experience, I, I worked five years as an artist in residence in Burg Theater in Vienna, which is the, the biggest ensemble in the world, 140 uh, fully paid actors. Um, and they, that's an, a very industrial machine. And in the beginning, I was very skeptical about it. But what we do, coming out of the performance, coming out of your body is your content, uh, your, your, your mind is your text. Who plays who? I play myself, this idea. Um, we come out of that. 
And when I write for uh, Martin or Grace, when they play in my place, I write for them or Grace gives the text that I, that we are working together and we are trying to work a long time with people. Uh, I work with, with, with more than 10 years with Martin, more than five years with Mohammed. People stay in Eat Company because there's something nice happening in what does it mean to make art? That's one thing. Then you have the professional actors of, of Burg Theater who are highly trained actors, and some of them are really, really, really very good, but they are total into reproduction. They want, they have to play every night another part. So they have to find a mechanism to not be themselves on stage, or they die. That's what they say. So. As one actor said to me, my hair is private. I will never play with my own hair. I, when I leave the building, nobody has to recognize me. And I was laughing in the beginning, and then I followed what he was doing for a few weeks. First night he played Chekhov, second night Molière, third night uh, Shakespeare. And always the main part, because it's really good. When he walks out of the theater, nobody recognizes him. And he said, my ego doesn't exist when I work. And I was touched by that. It's another job. And it's a beautiful job. And the result could be the same. And that's so extraordinary. When he's good and Grace is good, although Grace's approach can be totally different, when he's good, he's good. I don't care if Grace lies on stage about herself or not. I don't care to tell the truth or not. This is not what it's about. We, are, we don't tell the truth. But we try to be truthful somehow. But this guy saying my hair is private, it is also a very honorable approach to do theater. So there's a bridge already because I respect it. My experience is, by the way, after five years, I said, I cannot make what I want to make with these people. That's impossible. They don't go fur, fur, far enough. They will never do the second part of War Interpreter, and they will not do that. Punch. They will not do that. Because they cannot do that every night. That's the difference. Proszę Państwa, będziemy kończyć jeszcze dwie sprawy. O godzinie 17 tutaj kolejna e, rozmowa. E, będziemy rozmawiać o religii i nowoczesności. E, gośćmi Państwa i moimi będą. Pani Karolina Wigura, Pan Ludwik Dorn i ojciec Tomasz Dostatni, to już za nieco ponad pół godziny. A teraz chciałem jeszcze zaprosić na scenę dyrektora Malty Michała Melczyńskiego, który prosił o głos. Shortly in English, the, direct, the boss of the festival, the chief of the festival is coming, so beware. Do not run away. There's nowhere to run. I want to thank you to our curators for they have done for this whole weekend. In fact, for the whole time they spent on Malta since 2010, because it was several being there, being here. And um, I could say that our relation grew up for this year. But I want to say one thing. I think that in this one of the best in the world performing art group, theater has a special place as a way of the narration, but the, the very, very special place has the music. And we experience that, especially on Wednesday. We have experienced that in the many performances of um, Meet Company that we saw here in Poznan. The fragile music of Isabella Ruhm, Martin, and Hans-Peter Dahl. Hans Martin made the special production for, not for Malta, but the premiere was here, yeah? Then Hans-Peter had the special production with uh, the moon. That was his music. Then was the Isabella Room, and this is the composer, but Herbert von Karajan, yeah? 
I call him Herbert for Karayan. Roman, yeah, because I call him for Herbert for Karayan from the Wednesday. Beautiful singers, dancers, but you know, the music somehow moved this theater on. Jan is the singer. Everybody sings great here. But what we saw here on Wednesday, this very special concert, that was like, maybe that's the good metaphor. I think we were like in the, this square was like the loudspeaker. And they, they, they were the sole source of rhythm, source of sound, and we were like the resonator. You know, where is this loudspeaker, and where it's going and going and going, that everything resonates. So I think what I can give them before they leave, I'm sure they will be back, but what I can give them, and I was going yesterday, a day before yesterday, to look for some Polish music, on LP and with one exception is the Polish music but there is the one exception is Grace Grace Ellen and this is the old LP uh, published by Eterna Eterna was the legendary publishing house for the classical music in DDR Deutsche Demokratische Republik. But they had an enormous uh, recording because they bought almost everything from Deutsche Grammophon. And this is the legendary recording for Lied for den Erde. Which was the beginning of thinking about the performance we saw. I was wondering, should I give it to you or to you? I think to you. <laughs> but for Martin, I was looking for the, something really special. And I found yesterday something really special. Because this is the, 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 the this, this, this LP is called the Ritual of the Rhythm and the Sounds. He is a lot for the rhythm. And this is the very fantastic rec uh, recording from the live performance from 87 on the Polish band called Ossian and that was uh, recorded in the Palais of the uh, Prime Bishop in Warsaw and this is absolutely outstanding. I believe that the rhythm you generate uh, are great but these are different but fantastic great written and this balance between written and silence is it's 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 wonderful the cover is in the very bad shape but the lp is in the very good shape because this is they are old lp 85 87. Wow. Thank you so much. your cover is in very good shape yeah young just one remark. Several times I saw Jan on stage, but I never seen him like here. When he was the lead guitar in this outstanding concert. And that was like um, all styles playing guitar for these All Tomorrow Parties. But there is not All Tomorrow Parties on this. I made some consultant, consultation, cons, cons, consultant and scene. Yeah. And this is a fantastic recording from 72. Okay. It's Jutznia Utrenia by Krzysztof Penderecki. Outstanding recording with the choirs from nowadays in Ukraine at that time SSSR. And this is this moment when, during Easter, in the Pravoslavia, um, pra Orthodox, uh, uh, they uh, celebrate the, the, the resurrection. So, Jan, Jutschnia Utrenia for you. Be our Jutschnia Utrenia all the time.
and, and last but not least, I would like to ask Elke here. Yeah. Elke! When, when we have been working for years with the company, with Elke we built a special relation and discuss all the things about how, when, what, etc. And then I knew that we, if I talk to Elke, then I talk like I talk with Jan because they are very close, like the co-workers. But she is absolutely wonderful and for sure the best violinist in Lead Company. Have you seen it? Like she was playing, and 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 this is the LP with the legendary Polish violinist on jazz because she improvising and um, I think you will, love, you will love it, okay? <laughs> the LP is called Kilimanjaro. Yes, perfect. Zbigniew Seifert for Elke. Thank you. Take the music with you, be back like this loudspeaker. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Jennifer and Bati, Jan Alves, Martin Zegers, Kuratosha Tegoros and Martin. Thank you very much. I have a good rehearsal and listening to the great music. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah.